John, my name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here. And in case you're new, December for us is a season we call Beautiful Feet, in which we take a special offering just for our friends in areas like Mexico, Moldova, Africa, and the like that you've been seeing on the videos. And during this season, we don't really put up a bunch of pictures to make you feel guilty about the hurtful things that are happening in other parts of the world, but we want to put up pictures of beauty to show you just how you guys are making such a huge impact and difference around the world. And some of you were here, how many of you were here last weekend, last Sunday, and heard Pastor John Whitty talk about the jar of Jif? Remember that? And what we did was, it, you know, you kind of had to be here to hear, to hear the story, but we kind of did an auction for a jar of Jif, you know, to see how much we could raise for the Beautiful Feet uh, offering there that, that goes towards our friends in Mexico and all around the world. And um, this, uh, just this last hour in the last service over at Bandera Road Campus, Pastor Whitty was giving that message there. And a lady paid over $5,000 for a jar of Jif that goes towards Beautiful Feet. Okay. So check this, check this part out. Um, between services, you know, I'm like texting it up with Witty, you know. And what he told me was when the woman went back to pay her check for winning the, option, uh, the auction, she actually doubled it to 10 grand going towards uh, Beautiful Feet. So right on God for that, right? How cool is that? <laughs> and so we're just all so grateful for, for the fine folks that go to our church, like you guys who are, who are giving in so many ways to see beautiful things happen around the world and you know i couldn't help but think about when i was seeing fidel and marianita there i was thinking about these two little girls that i know they rescued from the the mountains and they brought them into the orphanage and these little girls didn't even know how to work the bathroom they were trying to like wash their hands in the toilet because they'd never been exposed to you know our kind of plumbing in that and so they were able to train them in that and those little girls grew up got their educations and now work in the banking industry. Isn't that cool? The way God did that and that's through, yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually pass offering plates or the buckets, like it's like paint buckets or something, you know, we're too ghetto to have like big, you know, fancy things or whatever around here. Um, we don't put our money into the offering plates or anything. We're gonna pass those in just a minute, but before we do, um, I wanted to just tell you one last story and bring a picture for you. And it's a picture of a little girl who lives in Liberia, Africa. Her name is Grace and my family uh, and Grace, we have a special relationship together. My little daughter is about her age and has the middle name of Grace. And my daughter sent me as the delivery boy to send her a couple of little toys, you know, the little Woody doll and the little Jesse doll there. I want to make a Jesse doll of our worship leader, Jesse, just a little one, you know, I can take it down to Mexico and give it to the kids, you know, and stuff like that. Um, you, you pull a string and it plays, you know, his music or whatever. Um, that would be great. But anyways, I took these little toys uh, to Grace, was the delivery boy for my daughter there. And when I think about Grace and I look at her picture, I think of how she's connected to you. And it's because of you and your generosity in the Beautiful Feet offering that Grace and the people in her community have clean drinking water because of you what you've done. Um, because of you and your generosity, uh, Pastor Brent and Dave are able to go over and train the pastors in her community. So her pastor is well trained. Because of you, she gets education. Because of you, when she gets sick or uh, people in her village get malaria, they have a medical clinic to go to. Because of you, there are microloans available so that her mother can actually have her own business to work and provide for her family. So can I just say in front of God and you, thank you for the ways that you guys are making a huge difference through the Beautiful Feet offering. And uh, as the ushers are prepared to kind of pass the buckets for the Beautiful Feet offering, I just want to say a brief word of prayer of blessing over this offering. Father, thank you for our people here who give so generously to the Beautiful Feet offering. And as we give it, we just thank you for your grace to us. Your grace to us that many of us have gotten free from addictions. Your grace to us that many of us have been helped with the gospel to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because of your grace 
uh, to us. Many of our marriages have been saved. Because of your grace to us, we have roofs over our heads and we will have food to eat today because of your grace. And now it's our joy out of the overflow of our hearts and because of the ways that you blessed us that we have opportunity to even give to serve other people in other parts of the world. And Father, we pray that you would fully leverage this offering to do your good purposes and turn ugly things around the world into beauty. Thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. You know my heart. You know my soul. You know my mind. And all that it holds. You know how hard I try. You know where I am, you know where I've been, you know these eyes and all that they've seen, you know how hard I try.
I will praise you, Lord. Hear my soul singing Alleluia. I will praise you, Lord. My soul singing Alleluia. I will praise you. My soul. Lord, we say in your presence that we love you. Bless your holy name. Bless you for your mercy, for your grace. Bless you for the abundance of our lives. Lord, as I consider our friends in Chihuahua, our friends in Moldova, our friends in Liberia, I'm just reminded of how blessed we are here. And I just want to say in your presence, thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, Lord. And I do ask, Lord, that you would take this offering that has been given, and I ask you to bless it, Lord, in the same way that you caused the loaves and the fish to multiply. I ask that you would cause this offering to be blessed in its impact in the lives of those it goes to serve. We thank you that you will bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to see you guys here at City Church downtown. My name's uh, Pastor Brent. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm normally over at the Bandera Road campus. And so I wanted to bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters at the Bandera Road campus and say to you, Merry Christmas. Hope you have a good holiday season. Now, you know, this is the time of year where we, we reflect on the coming of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, his birth, uh, you know, the, the manger scene and all of those parts of the Christmas story, and it makes me wonder, like, what, what would our lives be like if Jesus had never come? What would our lives be like if Jesus had never been born? And in particular, I wonder, how would all of us in this room, those of you in the video cafe, those of you watching online, how would we deal with our guilt? Have you ever, like, done something that you felt guilty about? You ever had one of those temptations? You just couldn't resist. I grew up here in San Antonio, and uh, one of my favorite things to do as a child was to go out to my grandparents' ranch. Uh, they had a ranch out in Halotus when Halotus was like way out in the middle of nowhere, you know, when I was a kid. I've lived here that long. And, uh, and I remember one time I had gone up to my grandparents' ranch. I was about 10, and uh, my little cousin Rob was up there. He was about 8. That's Pastor Dave's little brother. And uh, we would go up to my grandparents' ranch, and we would ride motorcycles, we would ride horses. And we would shoot stuff, you know, it was good guy fun. And so I remember we were up there and we had our BB guns out and we were shooting at tin cans in the backyard. And I remember uh, we were, took a few rounds and I said, hey, Rob, why don't you go check and see how we're doing? And, and then Rob went up, you know, he went up to check the cans and then he did something. And when he did this, this feeling overcame me. He went up to check the cans and he went like this. Now I want to ask you a question. What would you do if your little cousin stuck his rear end in your face and you had a loaded BB gun? That's right, I shot him. And as soon as I shot him, these other feelings overwhelmed me. These feelings of remorse and guilt. I was like, oh my gosh, I shot my cousin. And he jumped up and down and he cried. And then grandpa came out and he yelled at me and he took my gun away and told me not to shoot people and all that kind of stuff. Now, I wish I could tell you that that was the worst thing I've ever done. But it's not. I've done things that have hurt other people much, much more than that BB gun hurt my cousin Rob. And those things that I have done have brought much more intense feelings of guilt into my life. What about you? Are you living with guilt today? Have you ever done things that you're ashamed of? Things you wish you could undo? And how do you handle your guilt? Do you handle your guilt? Are you even aware of guilt that may be in your life? I suspect that some of you came to this place today and you've been living with this burden. You sort of feel it. Maybe it's like this cloud that follows you around and you're not sure what it is. Well, I want to suggest 
that for some of you, that cloud, that burden, could be unresolved guilt. Without Jesus, we would have guilt without hope. And it's my prayer today that you would leave this time with me, with us, without guilt in your life. Let's just talk a little bit about what guilt is, okay? Just what is guilt? Guilt occurs when we break a law or a commandment of God in some way. Guilt occurs when we sin. And I believe that God created us to feel guilt. He created us to have a conscience, you know, to have like an awareness of that which is morally right and morally wrong. And guilt is the emotional and mental burden we feel when we sin, right? Like when your cell phone goes off in church, right? <laughs> Just kidding, man. Just kidding. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's bring it back. Okay, guilt is the emotional and mental burden you feel when you sin, like how I felt when I shot my cousin in the rear end. And God didn't create us to feel guilt because he's trying to hurt us. See, I think God uh, created us to feel guilt because guilt ultimately serves a redemptive purpose. I believe that God created us to feel guilt because he loves us and he wants to deliver us from the impact of sin in our lives. And so in that way, guilt actually helps us. It's sort of like when we feel a physical pain. You know how, it, when, you know, when you know something's wrong with your body, like when you feel a pain. When you feel pain in your body, it tells you that something's wrong, something's broken, something's torn, something's sick. And that tells us to go get it fixed, to get it right. So in that sense, pain is ultimately redemptive. Pain helps even though it hurts. And guilt is the same way. Guilt is ultimately redemptive. Guilt helps even though it hurts. Now I want to take a moment and distinguish true guilt from false guilt because some people live with this foreboding sense of false guilt in their lives and I, I can set you free from that really quickly, all right? Well, what is the difference between true guilt and false guilt? True guilt occurs when we sin, when we break a commandment of God. But false guilt occurs when we feel those same, that same emotional and mental burden, but we didn't do anything wrong, okay? And false guilt can come into our lives in various kinds of ways. One way that false guilt comes into our lives is from religious traditions that are not commands of God. And so I think about Jesus' day. There was a religious group of people called the Pharisees. And they taught people that you had to wash your hands in a certain kind of way before you ate. And they noticed that Jesus and his disciples didn't wash their hands in the way that they taught. And so they tried to make Jesus feel guilty about it. And if you go and read the scripture, Jesus wouldn't take any of it. He said, I will obey the commands of my Father, but I do not have to obey the traditions of man. And so he, he distinguished traditions of man from the commands of his Father. And he would not take any false guilt into his life. Now some of us have grown up in religious traditions that sometimes have brought false guilt into our lives. And maybe you have felt that. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Where you were made to feel guilty about things that were not really sins recorded in the scripture. Like I remember I had a friend who grew up in a religious tradition, a Christian religious tradition where she was taught that if you played cards, it was a sin. You know, like a deck of cards. If you played cards, it was a sin. And she told me that one time when she was a child, uh, she was playing the card game Old Maid uh, with some friends, and her aunt caught her and made her sit in the corner for three hours for playing Old Maid. Now, I want to suggest to you that playing Old Maid is not a sin. Okay? That's an avenue of false guilt. And so if you've been taught any traditions of man through your religious tradition, and that has brought false guilt in your life. You do not have to accept any of that. You can reject it just like Jesus did. Another avenue that brings false guilt into our lives is when we blame ourselves for the actions of others. Sometimes I've noticed the kids of, who have gone through a divorce with their parents, they blame themselves for what happened. They think, if I was just a better son, if I was just a better daughter, my parents wouldn't have broken up. Or sometimes people who have gone through abuse uh, feel like it's their own fault that they're being abused. And sometimes the abusers even tell them that. It's your fault that I'm abusing you. And sometimes uh, kids who've grown up in an alcoholic home, they feel like it's their fault that their parents get wasted. They feel like, well, if I was just a better kid, my, my dad wouldn't drink so much. My mom wouldn't feel so depressed that she has to drink so much. 
I'm going to say this to you. If you've ever experienced anything like that, you are not responsible for the actions of others. And you do not need to feel guilt for the sins of other people. That's false guilt. Another avenue that brings false guilt in our lives is when we keep on feeling guilty for a sin we actually have committed, but once we've confessed it, we keep on feeling guilty about it. You know what I'm saying? It's like when we've sinned and we confess it, but we just keep on feeling guilty about it. Okay? Now, and this is what I've noticed. Sometimes when, when we hurt someone deeply, or when we commit one of the big sins, you know what I'm talking about, the big sins? And even though we confess it and we turn from it, we just keep on beating ourselves up about it, thinking, oh man, how could I have done that? You know, how could I have ruined this person's life? Or how could I have ruined my life? How stupid, stupid. And we just keep beating ourselves up about this sin that we've already confessed. When we do that, we fail to forgive ourselves the way that God actually has already forgiven us. You do not need to live with that kind of burden. That is false guilt. And you do not have to accept false guilt. But then there is true guilt, right? And we are supposed to admit and deal with true guilt. Well, what are the signs that you may have unresolved true guilt in your life? Well, the most obvious one uh, is if you have sinned and you know it and you're feeling the emotional and mental burden that comes with it, well, that's a sign that you have unresolved guilt. And I'm going to lead you in a moment to resolve that guilt. But there's also some subtle signs of unresolved guilt. Things like frequent physical illnesses and fevers with no biological cause. I've seen this in people. Or the fear of going to church or reading the Bible or participating in religious activities. I've seen it through unexplained physical pains. I've seen it through feelings of unworthiness or uncleanness. When a person, they they, they feel and they think and sometimes they even speak it out loud. Oh, I just feel so dirty. I feel so unworthy, so unclean. That is often the sign of unresolved guilt. I've seen uh, unresolved guilt uh, manifesting itself with mental anguish, some kinds of depression. I've also uh, noticed uh, a person struggling with unresolved guilt. Sometimes they, they recount their sin over and over. You know what I mean? They just keep on you know, going through what happened in their mind. It's like they're playing this movie in their mind. And they just can't get beyond it. They can't get over it. That is often the sign of unresolved guilt. And then there's the whole issue of what do you do If you realize you have true guilt, it's unresolved in your life. How do you handle your guilt? Without Jesus, people will often try to handle their guilt in unhealthy ways. Some people try to handle their guilt by paying for their sin by doing good works. And so this is what they think. I have this sin I've committed. It's brought guilt into my life. And if I just do enough good works, if I just keep on doing these good works, it'll make me feel better. And it doesn't because that's not what takes guilt away. Some people try to cover up their sins. And they think if they hide it and nobody else knows about the sin, then they won't feel bad about it. But guess who knows about it? You do. I do. It, that doesn't help you deal with guilt and the burden that comes with it. Some people try to fake it or redefine sin. They think they can fake their conscience out. And so when they sin, they try to redefine the sin or justify the sin. And they think that'll make them feel better. It doesn't. Some people try to manipulate the spirit realm. Psychic curanderas, stuff like that. They, they think that if they can do something in the spirit realm, that it'll change the way they feel about their guilt. That is not what takes our guilt away. And then some people try to numb their guilt with alcohol, with drugs, or with other addictive compulsive behaviors. But we believe that God has provided for us another way to deal with our guilt. <clears throat> now in the Old Testament times, Through the prophet Moses, God instituted what we now call a substitutionary sacrificial system. Can you say that word with me, substitutionary? Can you say it out loud? Substitutionary. Okay, now what I did is I just taught you a theological word from the Old Testament. All right, it's the substitutionary sacrificial system. Let me sort of explain how it worked. Back in Moses' day, if you were a believer and you came to church, you would bring with you an animal to sacrifice, whether it was a dove or a lamb or a calf, uh, depending on how wealthy you were. And so when you came to church, that animal then would be sacrificed to pay for your sins. And it's called a substitutionary sacrifice because what God allows is that when we lift up another animal and that animal was sacrificed, 
he allowed that animal to pay for the sins of another being. So one being pays the price for sin, another being receives forgiveness for that sin. That's why it's called a substitutionary sacrifice. And so if you think about it, like if, if we were believers in Old Testament times, you know, we, we like to worship in nice, cool, vibey kind of theaters and stuff like that, you know. This is the first time I've ever preached on a runway. It's sort of cool, you know. Okay. And, uh, but like if this was Old Testament times, the, the, the church would have been more like a slaughterhouse if you think about it. I mean, there would be blood, there would be guts, there would be animal carcasses, you know, fur everywhere. I don't want to gross you out in church or anything, but I mean, it was, it was pretty brutal. And because of that, I think the Old Testament believers live with this vivid awareness of the gravity of sin and the cost of guilt in our lives. But here is the problem with the Old Testament sacrificial system that God himself developed. Once the animal was sacrificed, it could only pay for the sins committed up to the time of the sacrifice. And so whenever we sinned again, and we normally do, you had to bring another sacrifice, and you had to repeat it over and over. But that's where the Christmas story becomes so relevant. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that, that word we've translated engaged in our version is expressing the Hebrew practice of betrothal. It was a much more binding relationship than an engagement was. For, like, like in their day, when you got betrothed, you know, in, in our day, the, the uh, bride's family normally pays for the wedding, right, if they're, if they're able. Well, in their day, the groom paid what was called a bride's price. So if you decided you wanted to marry a young woman, you had to pay a bride's price. And betrothal began when you paid half the price up front, and then you had to wait for about a year before you got married. So guys, think about it. It's like putting a down payment on your, your fiancé, and then you have to wait for a year to get married. This was a binding relationship. You know what I'm saying? She got half my money already. And then she gets all the rest of it when she gets married, right? That's how it works. Okay. So anyway, this, this covenant was so binding that if either party pursued another person during betrothal, it was considered adultery. And if uh, the, the relationship became broken, you had to actually go through the formality of a divorce. And so when, prayer, when Mary became pregnant, Joseph, out of bitterness or anger, could have divorced her in a very public kind of ugly way to embarrass her for his pain. But he didn't do that. Verse 19, Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly, literally divorce her quietly. Now, I want to pause for just a moment and say something about Joseph. You know, normally we sort of focus on Mary and the, the birth of Jesus and her part of the story, but, you know, this little verse here says a lot about who Joseph was and what kind of person he was. Because at this point, he's just thinking that she's fooled around on him during their betrothal, he's already paid half the, the, the bride price. But instead of being bitter and angry and trying to embarrass her, he wanted to put her away quietly rather than harm her any. That, that says a lot about Joseph. I hope we can be men. I hope we can be men like Joseph. Well, anyway, so he's, he's thinking about putting her away quietly, and then an angel appears to him. Verse 20. As Joseph considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel appears to Joseph and tells Joseph, Look, Joseph, you're going to have to believe something, and you're the only man in all human history who will ever have to believe this particular thing. And that is that your girlfriend got pregnant, but she didn't mess around on you. Because what is within her is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph believed the word of the angel. And then the angel told Joseph 
to name this son a specific name. Normally in their day, the fathers named the sons. And normally they named the sons after people in their own family. But the angel said, I don't want you to name him any name from your family. You are to name him Jesus. Literally, the Lord saves. Jesus means the Lord saves. And he said, you are to name him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. Jesus was born to be a savior. He was born to be the final substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. And how did that happen? We believe that when he was lifted up on the cross that he paid the final substitutionary sacrificial payment for our sins so that our guilt could be taken away. And because he was raised from the dead, he is a living sacrifice and we never have to sacrifice again. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. Think about that. We actually become the righteousness of God through faith in Him. He, he takes our sin. We receive His righteousness. And from that point forward, that is how God sees us. There is power in the name of Jesus to forgive us of our sin. There is power in the name of Jesus to relieve us of our guilt. A few weeks ago, I heard a very amazing story about the power of the name of Jesus Christ. One of the Beautiful Feet ministries that our church supports is called Sammy Tippett Ministries. Uh, Sammy was one of my mentors, spiritual mentors, when I was in college. And uh, he started a ministry that serves the persecuted church and brings the good news about Jesus in places that are very difficult. So he goes into places like Iran, the Sudan, Somalia, Egypt, Liberia, and then into difficult places in India. Well, a few weeks ago, he was holding some meetings uh, in one of these difficult places in India called the Punjab region, where most of the people who live there are Sikhs. They're from a Sikh background. And it's on the border of Pakistan and India, so it's a very turbulent part of our world. Well, anyway, he was invited by a local church there to hold these uh, meetings to, to sh uh, share the good news about Jesus Christ. So what they did was they rented this big tent that seated about 5,000 people. And then they had speakers outside in the courtyard where thousands more could hear. And so each night between five and 8,000 people would gather to hear this message about Jesus Christ in this town. Well, Sammy told me that on the last night of these meetings, he felt led to preach about the power of of the name of Jesus to change our lives. And so he's speaking about the power of the name of Jesus to change our lives. And he said that while he was speaking, this man stood up in the middle of the crowd and he just stood up and he, he said the man sort of went like this. And Sammy's philosophy, I said, well, what'd you do? You know, and, and Sammy's philosophy is like, okay, whenever things happen in another place, you just keep on preaching and hope it all works out, right? So he keeps on talking about Jesus and this man begins to come toward the stage. And so uh, Sammy told me that the stage that he was on there, unlike this stage, which has stairs on each side, well, the stage he was speaking from, the steps were right in the middle of the stage, and his podium was right in front of those steps. Well, he said the man came up and began to walk up the steps. And of course, Sammy's thinking, okay, why doesn't somebody get this guy and get him out of the way? So what Sammy told me he did was he sort of came over to the side of the stage and just kept preaching over here. Well, anyway, this guy comes up on the stage, and he stops in front of Sammy's Bible on the podium and he takes out a hundred rupee bill, puts it in Sammy's Bible, and then he walks back to his place. So Sammy's not quite sure what in the world has just happened. And so anyway, he finishes uh, preaching and then he invites people who want to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior for the first time. And he said about half the people who were present came forward. He was overwhelmed by the response. Well, later, he learned the rest of the story. You see, he talked to the Indian pastor whose church had co-sponsored that meeting with him and found out who this man was. The pastor told Sammy that this man was a Hindu and that uh, everybody in the town knew this guy and he was hired by the church to run the lighting that was there in the tent. Well, what the pastor and all of the people in the town knew about that man that Sammy did not know is that he was lame. He had suffered a severe accident years earlier and was unable to walk. 
And while Sammy was speaking about the power of the name of Jesus to change lives, the man told the pastor, the Hindu man told the pastor that he felt this warmth go through his legs. And when he felt it, it shocked him, and so he stood up. And when he stood up, he realized he was healed. And then he didn't know what else to do, so he just went up there and gave an offering to the man who had told him about Jesus. It was an amazing story of the power of Jesus' name. And I want to say this to you. There, there is power in the name of Jesus to heal the sick. There is power in the name of Jesus to forgive us of our sins. And there is power in the name of Jesus to wash away all of our guilt. I hope you believe that. What I'd like to do uh, in, in this part of my message and as we prepare to take communion I want to make sure that you've dealt with any guilt that may be in your life. And so I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. Those of you watching in the video cafe or online, you just do the same. And if you're here today and you know that you're a child of God, you know that your sins have been forgiven because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you have no doubt about that. You know that we can still have guilt come into our lives when we sin. And the scriptures are very clear what we as believers are supposed to do when we sin. 1 John 1.9 says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the way we are to respond to guilt is by confession, by confessing our sins. And so I want to ask you, wherever you are, if you know that there is a sin in your life, I ask you to confess it to speak it in God's presence. Even now, wherever you are, begin to whisper and confess to God and ask Him to forgive you of your sin and to wash away all guilt, all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for washing away our sin. And if you're here today or watching on the internet or in the video cafe and, and you would say, you know, Pastor Brent, I'm really not sure about my relationship with God. I've never begun that relationship. I'm just not confident that, about that. Then the right way for you to respond to the guilt that is in your life is to believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that He died to pay for your sin and your guilt can also be washed away. If, if that is you, then maybe you would pray this prayer with me. Maybe whisper it as I pray it out loud. Just repeat after me. God, I believe in you. And I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that he died on the cross to pay for my sin. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sin to wash away all of my guilt and to make me your child. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, the one I just prayed for the first time, I want you to know this. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ, according to the promise of God, you are a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. Your guilt is washed away. You are pure you are as white as snow in God's presence and in His eyes. And according to the Word of God, He has put a seal upon you, His thumbprint, by giving you His Holy Spirit. And you are now a child of God. You don't ever have to wonder about it again. You are a child of God because of what Christ has done for you. And what we're going to do uh, here in a moment as we're winding down our service, we're going to take communion and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. So we have broken pieces of bread. We have juice that is in a cup. And what I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is to take a piece of the broken bread, to dip it into the juice, and then to eat it. And as you eat it, remember the body of Jesus that was broken for you. Remember his blood that was shed for you. And be grateful. What I'm going to ask is that those who are in this section over here, if you would receive the communion at the station here, and if you'll just come forward and receive it and return back to your seats. For those who are in this center section, if you will exit uh, out your left, my right, and come and receive at this station here, and then return back to your seats. 
And for those of you who are over in this section, if you will just come and receive at this station and then return to your seats. Come, let's celebrate together. Wash away the one I used to be The wall I need just hold me Until I fall asleep 